Coming up, how an expecting mother with stage three cancer beats the odds because of prayer. And after Benny is healed of a brain injury, he sets out to share a message of hope. Welcome to 700 Club Canada today, and we are talking today about God being in control. <laughs> well, Bill, that, I, don't, yeah, I don't know how you're feeling. I miss you already, but uh, it's great that you're able to join us uh, through your own studio there. As we've been seeing over this past year, Bill, life is full of storms, right? And as much as we try, it's pretty clear that there are many things that we cannot control. So how are you feeling about anything in your life that you had to give up some control? <laughs> Well, absolutely. This week, of course, filming uh, in extension in my own studio here in my church because of circumstances beyond my control, I have just learned, you know what? God always is in control, even when you feel like you are not. And, you know, I was reminded of Jesus in the storm um, and he's in the boat and the disciples actually ask a really interesting question. They ask him, don't you care? And when you think about it, it's kind of a ridiculous question. The fact that he's in the boat shows that he cares. But I think sometimes when we feel out of control, we ask God the same question. And the truth is, no, he is actually with us and he calms the storms. And so I've been leaning deep into that this week, even though I'd love to be there with you uh, in person. It's great to be here in studio in my own church facility. Well, you know, I'm glad you're, you're I'm glad you're with us here, too. But that's a good question, though. And maybe lots of viewers have watched. And do you care? Do, do you see me? Right. And in our troubled right. times, well, Today, you'll see that giving up control of our situation to God can open the door to something greater than you ever imagined. And it could also save your life. That's right. A stage three cancer diagnosis let Amy know that she wasn't in control, but it's worse. She was six weeks pregnant. Amy will share how the power of prayer saved two lives in her incredible story a bit later in the program. And you'll see how faith helped one man find healing from a traumatic brain injury. But first, I have the privilege of speaking with Andy Morris, founder of Prayer in the Park. The idea began with a simple question. What would it look like for us in our region to come together in unity like never before? And on June 6 in Waterloo, Ontario, Andy and many others will get their answer. Well, welcome to the 700 Club Canada, Andy. Really glad to have you on today. Yes, thank you. I'm honored to be here. Well, tell me what led you to start Prayer in the Park. All right, thank you. Uh, it all started back in the fall of 2016. I had just finished reading a book on prayer called A Year of Living Prayerfully by Jared Brock. And I learned a lot about prayer from that book. And then at church one Sunday, we were singing a song about the Shekinah glory of God, how it God's power and presence showed up when the Israelites all gathered to dedicate the temple. And then that led me to reflect on and study some of the other times where the Israelites were gathering to seek God. And I was studying about King Hezekiah and the renewal that he brought when he first became king after many years of not following God that the Israelites right. had been doing. Yeah. And so he wanted to bring everybody back to God and they wanted to start by celebrating the Passover, but they couldn't do everything according to the ceremonial rules. But he prayed and he said, God, would you pardon anyone who sets their heart on seeking you? And God answered his prayer. Yeah. And then they go through this big celebration. And ultimately it says nothing like this had happened in Israel since the days of Solomon. Right. So then God kind of put the question on my heart, well, what would it look like in Waterloo region where I live to thus gather and seek God like we had never done before? Well, you know and what? Then, yeah. Uh, and then that's what spurred it on for you? Exactly. So then as I kind of continued to seek God on what that would look like, that's where Prayer in the Park ultimately came from. So I started sending emails and phone calls out into the universe to say, hey, let's get together and pray. And we were able to pull it off in, the, in June of 2017 for the first event. And we've been going since then. And the pandemic, of course, has caused us to come up with some new ideas of how we might gather to pray to seek God with our hearts. Uh, and so last year we did a live stream and then this year we're trying uh, the, to encourage people to form their own micro gatherings at a local park near them. So we're pre-producing a video that will lead people through their time of prayer in their own park to pray this year on June the 6th. 
Well, I think it's an amazing idea. I mean, we've all been thinking, what can we do, right? I mean, we know what we can't do, but I love that God gives us creative ideas as to what we can do and we can always pray. So tell me, what's the response been and what have you learned about prayer through this journey? Yeah, well, it's interesting. It's the, the response has both been way greater than I could have expected and yet also in some other ways lots of room for growth because the the response as far as people coming around me and supporting me to help pull this pull these different prayer events off right and the people that i've met the people amazing people of prayer has been so overwhelming because like, i'm just some guy throwing emails and phone calls out and right. that all these people gather around to to help people do this and i've got there's an amazing team now and uh, we hope to see thousands and thousands of people gathering to pray and we haven't quite got to that point but we have been able to reach a lot of people and invite a lot of people in to pray, and it's been really amazing. And it's what have I learned about prayer is a lot, that's for sure. Yeah. Well, uh, it, you know, I, yeah, go ahead. Okay, sorry. Yeah. The one thing that I really say that I've learned is the difference between when God leads a prayer meeting and when we just try to lead it ourselves. Mm. When God shows up and people are just following along with what He wants us to pray for and then his power and his presence show up is it's just such an incredible experience to be able to connect with god together like that and i've learned that by meeting all these amazing people of prayer don't you find that the beauty of unity in the body that when we actually do what jesus said and we work as one i mean that invites the glory and the presence of god and that's yeah. what I hear you saying is happening. I mean, this is a move of God. And I really affirm that. I, I really believe that if more of us would gather in appropriate size groups across our nation, that we would perhaps see even a greater move of God. What impact have you seen in your community as a result? Yeah, that's exactly right. And one of my favorite verses that I picked up through all of this is in Philippians chapter four. It goes on talking about how God equips us to do different things and to build up unity, which leads to maturity. And then in unity and maturity, then we experience the fullness of God. Yeah. So that's what we really want to see. And that's why I want to keep inviting people in to pray because that's the order of things that God has given us, right? That right. we pray, yes. he moves and he calls us into action. Yes. And so we've seen a lot of different uh, response from people and getting involved in prayer and seeing a few other little prayer groups forming. And we know that, that God is moving with us as we pray. Well, I understand that you're inviting all of Canada, anyone who would like to join. So how can we participate then with you if you said you're making a video, so could people gather in small groups in parks in their area, wherever they are in Canada, and tune in to what you're doing and you will lead us through a prayer time? Yeah, absolutely. Everyone is welcome, of course, to come and join us in prayer. So the, the video will be live premiering on YouTube at two o'clock on June the 6th. Wonderful. Through Kingdom Insight TV. Uh, it's a partnership that we've formed with them. Okay. Uh, so that's where we find it. And uh, we have the links will all be on the prayerinthepark.ca website as well. Okay. Uh, and so that's exactly right. We'd invite you to whatever the local guidelines are as far as how many people you can connect with outside. Grab a group up to that size. Uh, grab your, your phone or your tablets and the video will introduce. Here's what we want to pray for. And you can push pause and take as much time as you want to pray for. Wonderful. Push play and then be led through to the next thing to pray for. And Wonderful. We'll it sounds like an exciting way. Prayer. It sounds like an exciting way for all of us to participate. I thank you, Andy, for taking for saying yes to God in doing this. So we know it's God's idea. It's going to be great. So all the information you can find on at 700club.ca, go there. We'll put all the links there. Let's get out in the parks and let's pray. Thank you so much, Andy. Amen. Thank you so much. And now an expectant mother gets a cancer diagnosis and does the only thing she can do. She prays. Watch this. I don't know that you can really put into words what that diagnosis feels like until you've been there. When Amy Henley heard she had cancer, she knew her life wasn't the only one at stake. I was six weeks pregnant. I was 38 years old and I had stage three colorectal cancer. 
I did the only thing I knew to do. I got on my knees and I prayed. A week later, Amy went into surgery where doctors removed eight centimeters of her colon. Then a few days later, Amy's doctor came in with devastating news. The cancer had spread. They could treat it with chemo, but it would come at a cost. She told me that I had a 45% chance of survival if I had an abortion. Without an abortion, I had no chance. Other doctors agreed, but abortion was not an option for Amy and Bobby. What gives us the right to kill an un unborn baby? You know, a baby that has every potential of living and becoming, a, you know, an adult. It's like myself, who, who gives us the right to make that decision? And so many people will say to you, oh, I'm pro-life, except, well, I don't believe in that exception. I was that exception. I was the mother that was told it's your life or your baby's life. The couple sought out a second opinion. That's when they met Dr. Nikolanakis, an oncologist who prescribed a chemo regimen for Amy. I wasn't sure if it was going to be entirely safe or, you know, but I had confidence based on other examples with breast cancer and other types of cancer that I have treated um, that I think she, with the specific drugs that she would do well. It's a different cancer than what some of the other studies he was looking at it was different, but he said, I, I think it might work. And um, I won't make you any promises, but I will treat you if that's what you want. Amy was 14 weeks pregnant when she started the treatments, but she and Bobby knew the outcome depended on God. We were constantly praying. Prayer was a part of every day. I had people come up to me that I'd even know on the street that had heard about our situation and say, hey man, can I pray with you? And so they'd, they'd, they'd come and pray with me. Mauricia Parker, Amy's nurse during treatments at Athens Regional Medical Center, was touched by the couple's faith. And I can just remember her husband saying, we already love this baby. And that just hit me really hard that, you know, they already love this baby and they're gonna, you know, go through this really hard thing. What made it more difficult was there was no way to determine what effect the chemo might be having on the baby. There were no guarantees what could be happening to the baby, uh, but we had a piece about it. Even Amy's OBGYN, Dr. Sepasi, knew the baby was in God's hands. You have to step back and say, I really wasn't doing anything. All I was doing was reassuring her that things look good, that I'm willing to be a part of this with you. I'm willing to do your C-section whenever it's time to do it. After Amy endured 11 rounds of chemo, it was time for her scheduled C-section. We had several pastor friends that were there, my husband, and they just made a circle around my bed and we just held hands and prayed over the baby, over the delivery. As much as I wish I would do that with all my patients, <laughs> Um, it, it certainly was very profound that morning that that's something that we needed to do. And it made sense with everything that was leading up to that point that we needed to continue to remind ourselves to give God the glory and all of that. Joshua Hanley was born on August 28, 2010 in perfect health. I just cried, <laughs> overjoyed, thankful, so thankful. Not only was my little boy healthy, my wife was alive, you know, that, and that was 180 degrees from what we'd been told initially. I was, I was ecstatic. I mean, it was, it was wonderful. He was beautiful. She looked amazing, and she still had more treatments to go, but everything was just, it was just amazing. I just saw God's grace through that whole thing and how I don't always get to see that. Now five years old, Joshua is a typical active boy. So to me, the miraculous things are equally that you've got this cute little five-year-old who's running around seeming to act like everybody else. That child's gonna grow up to be a man one day and, um, and have a full life <clears throat> and a family that really loves him is to me extremely gratifying. I don't see that a lot. For me, that was extraordinary. As for Amy, the chemo was a success and there's been no sign of cancer since. We know that the Lord is bigger than any situation we could ever be in. And it doesn't matter what's going on. If you're in, if you're in the Lord's will, you're in the safest place you can be, regardless of the outcome of anything. If you're in God's will, that's where you want to be. And the Lord's in control of, of all that. We know that. God is always in control. 
And the thing I have learned is I don't have to understand what he's doing. He does not have to make sense to me. I just know God sees the beginning and he sees the end. He's got it all worked out and I trust that his will is perfect. And there is a peace in that. And he can be trusted to take care of the circumstances even when they don't make sense to us. Trust him. Trust him. Did you hear those words? What a beautiful reminder of how God can be trusted to take care of the circumstances, even when they don't make sense to us. You know, our church and our small group have been going through the story of Esther and talk about circumstances that didn't make sense. And yet in all of it, God was in control and working out his plan to save his people from an evil plot to destroy them. It's so interesting to me that Esther, she was an orphan. She's raised by her uncle. She's taken into captivity to be part of the king's harem. She's a Jew in the palace of, the, of a king surrounded by people who hate Jews and they want them destroyed. And yet God's name is not mentioned once in the book of Esther. And yet the work of God is clearly seen as he uses this really unworthy, unqualified girl to rescue his people. I think it's so amazing. So what circumstances are you facing? Do you need to know that God is in control? And will you surrender to his control? That's really the question, right? Will you like Esther and like Amy, we just saw, trust in God even though you don't know the outcome? I know I've been faced with this, this very question in my life many times. Will I trust God or will I choose to take on all of my circumstances on myself? And that is not the healthy way. That is not the God way. God wants us to trust him. I wanna take a moment to pray for you as you even think about, will you trust him? And Rosie sent a prayer request and she said, I have kidney failure. Please pray that my kidneys would be healed. Will you join me in prayer and bring that circumstance, that storm uh, that you have, that you just don't know where God is in control or whether he's in control. Father, we just bring all of our circumstances to you. We lay them at your feet. I, I just bring our dear sister Rosie to you and her kidney. And I just pray for healing in Jesus' name over Rosie. Would you, Lord, show your mighty hand and your power in people's lives? When they surrender control to you, would you do what only you can do? In Jesus' name, amen. Well, up next, God heals a man from a traumatic brain injury. It sounded almost like a gunshot. He landed on, it was our wood floor, and it was loud. And the first thing I expected to see was blood. Donna DeShera and her husband Benny were up early one morning in 2015. As they prepared for the day, Benny unexpectedly fainted and fell backwards hitting his head on their hardwood floor. Donna quickly realized it was serious. It wasn't long after that that he started telling me that his ears were ringing and he, he saw things in front of his face and he, he, he was having a severe, you know, head throb. Donna rushed Benny to the ER where doctors determined he had two skull fractures and bleeding in the brain. They were worried about him having seizures. They were worried about brain swelling. They already knew he was bleeding. Donna called friends from church and family asking for prayers for healing. Benny is the lead singer of the Christian rock band Empowered and as word of his injury spread, there were hundreds of people praying for his recovery. The prayers were important to me because I didn't know what was going on or what was going to happen. I mean, that's where I turn. I'm going to turn to God first and, you know, and start praying. Three days passed and Benny was still in the hospital. Donna continued to pray. The waiting is the hard part, is a really hard, hard thing to be in a situation where you don't know what's going to happen next. And the only thing I guess I know to do in that situation is just pray and ask God for, for guidance and ask him to be in control. Benny was discharged from the hospital and sent home to rest. Donna had to care for him round the clock as his recovery was still uncertain. 
I worried about the after effects. Was he going to be able to walk and function normally again and think normally again? He was awake and he didn't always make total sense, you know, when he spoke. Benny slept 20 hours a day for an entire month. Donna continued to look to God for peace. Okay, God, I'm giving this to you. You say, lay it at your feet, and you're not going to leave us, and you're going to take care of it, that you're in the battle with us. When I truly trusted God, then what I consider that peace is just to be able to do what I need to do and just, you know, the strength to do it. Towards the end of that time, Benny heard a voice that awakened him like never before. One afternoon, I became a little bit cognizant. Donna had left the house because she could leave me at that point. I still had a walker to get around in the house, but I was well enough to be left. And I got an audible voice from God in my living room. And he said, Benny, I have huge and great plans for you coming out of this thing. And this is what I need to come out of that. I need people to know that what I did for you, I stepped in and saved your life. What I did for you, I can do for them if they just press in and call out to me. And man, that was a seriously poignant time. I could tell that it had had a profound effect on him. He got teary-eyed and Benny's not one to cry, you know, real often, but it, it, it like brought him to tears. I mean, he when he was telling me about it and, and talking about God as his father and, you know, and how he came to him and said, you know, I have, I have great plans for you. After that, Benny made a remarkable recovery. His experience has strengthened his desire to share God's love. I'll talk to people about Jesus at any at any point. And it's it's almost dangerous now because I have this compelling thing where people have to know what he's done and what he can do for them. So the level of um, the level of sharing has definitely increased and, and it's the level of intensity in that sharing has increased as well. That intensity is felt by audiences during their shows. Benny and Donna are thankful for the prayers and the healing he received during his time of need. It's taught me to be grateful, to be thankful for today, to find the things that we can be grateful for even in the not so good situations. I think that's important for us to remember through all of the craziness, you know, that we can still be thankful for today and to put our thoughts on that instead of on the negative. We can sing our God is an awesome God, but when you go through something in your own personal life and you experience how awesome our God is, you cannot, even the rocks will cry out, right? So. You've got to cry out and just let people know what he's done for you. And, and it, it's, we're doing the Lord's work when we do that. The part that caught me in Benny's story was when he heard God say, what I've done for you, I can do for others. Now tell them. And I was so fascinated with that because I really do believe that, that the things we read about in the Bible are possible for us today but we need to tell others that it is possible for them. You know, in Matthew chapter 5, verse 14, Jesus said it this way. He said, You are the light of the world. A town built on a hill cannot be hidden. Neither do people light a lamp and put it under a bowl. Instead, they put it on its stand, and it gives light to everyone in the house. And then verse 16, it says, In the same way, let your light shine before others, that they may see your good deeds and glorify your Father in heaven. And so I got thinking about to myself, why does God do anything? And the truth is, he does it because he wants people to know him. And the chosen mechanism is you and I. God wants to do something in you so that in turn you can tell others about him. He loves changing people's lives. And he wants to do that not only for you, but for your friends and for your family, for your neighbors, all those around you. So can I just ask you a couple of questions? What has God done for you? And who have you told? Well, 
We'd love to help you with that. Why not call us today at 1-855-759-0700, and we'd love to put the pamphlet Witnessing in your hand to equip and empower you to share simply the story of God in your life to those around you so that they can know him too. We're going to be right back. CBN presents God is for us, verses of salvation, peace, and victory from the book of Romans. Do not conform to the pattern of this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind. Then you will be able to test and approve what God's will is, his good, pleasing, and perfect will. God is for us, a new audio recording by Pat Robertson, available now. We are so glad you joined us today. And maybe you're asking the question, is God really in control? I just want you to know that we believe that he is and we are here for you. As a matter of fact, we have a great resource. It's a CD entitled, God is for us. And it will equip and empower you with this truth that God is actually fighting for you. And if you'd like to become a partner of what we're doing here at 700 Club Canada, or maybe you'd like to help us by joining Pledge Express, we would love to put this great resource in your hand today. So please call 1-855-759-0700 and get that CD, God is for us. That's so good, Bill, and it's such a truth, isn't it? And I love our monthly magazine called Frontlines. I enjoy reading it. There's lots of practical stories in it, and also inspiration that will uh, encourage you. So if you're not getting our Frontlines magazine, either give us a call again or uh, go to 700club.ca and you can sign up right there. Bill, uh, I, I miss you being with me, but what a great reminder today that you know, when we feel out of control, we can always pray, right? And uh, prayer is a place Absolutely. that actually reminds me that I can give everything to God. What about you? Yeah, absolutely. I think we forget, right? We just, we forget. It's, it's interesting in the Bible, God has to say over and over again, remember, remember. And I think yeah. prayer is a way of remembering that yeah. God is actually for you and slowing yourself down pushing out all the noise and all the distraction and just saying, God, just remind me in this intimate moment that you're with me. I do, I do believe in the power of prayer that way. I do too. And I encourage you to do prayer in the park on June 6th. If you have some friends to gather with, maybe prayer in the backyard with, you know, family. But I just believe that as a nation, we need to gather and pray. It will allow and enable God to continue doing what only he can do. What's our power verse for yeah. today, Bill? Well, and to encourage you, I love this verse. It's in Joshua 1, 9, one of my favorite stories about Joshua. And God says, and he says it to all of us, have I not commanded you? Here's the command, be strong and courageous. Don't be afraid, don't be discouraged for the Lord your God will be with you wherever you go. And that is true for you. That is true for you and thanks for watching. To contact us, visit 700club.ca.